Thank you, worship team. Good evening, everyone. Everybody doing all right? Doing well? Good, good. Good to have you all at church this evening. Um, what I love about God's Word is that when we dive into it, we often get challenged and encouraged. And uh, I really like the challenging part, too. You know, we come to church to be challenged, right? Uh, we don't come just to be comfortable. We come to be challenged. I know uh, for me, coaching basketball the past eight years, oftentimes with every single team that I've had, it always seems that when you talk about something that we need to work on, it, you know, the team sort of like cringes, like, coach, we just want to talk about all the things that we do right, right? But instead, you know, it's important, I've learned with teams, to critique and to challenge areas of, of the culture or whatever uh, so that we can improve and be the best team possible. And that's what I love about God's Word is that we often get into areas of text that, uh, that are difficult and that are, are tough uh, to handle or that really speak to, to culture today. And, and one of those texts that we've, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount, one of, the, uh, one of those texts will be in today. So it's exciting. It's exciting that we get to be uh, challenged and it's exciting that we get to be encouraged as God points a new way forward for us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you that, Jesus, you don't shy away from tough topics. Uh, you don't shy away from um, things that our, our culture uh, doesn't want to face or doesn't like to talk about, God. But most importantly, we thank you that you pave a way forward for us, um, Father, in, in, in this world today, Lord, to be uh, your salt and your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Jesus has a text where he talks about do not commit adultery and he, and he talks about do not lust. And I think that this, this topic is one of those ones that it really points to a larger cultural issue, a larger cultural issue that we face uh, today. And that's a lack of understanding of true intimacy, a lack of understanding, a lack of a grid for true intimacy. Our society has, a, has an extremely warped view of intimacy, extremely warped view. I'm going to uh, talk to you about some things that we face today. The first thing is surface-level relationships, a warped view of intimacy. Everyone in this room understands that social media has changed the way that we relate to one another. We're able to communicate with people from far away, with friends. Some people use it for, uh, to stay connected with, with loved ones. Others use it to build their social capital. Uh, people use it for all types of reasons. Um, we, we get to be friends with people that we've never met face-to-face. -face. Think about that statement for a moment. We get to be friends with people we've never met face-to-face. -face. Well, others use, use it to just stay up-to-date uh, with what's going on in one another's lives. One University of Oxford researcher, he did a study, and he found that out of 150 Facebook friends, as he studied a lot of people, out of 150 Facebook friends, an average user, user only has 15 who could be considered as actual friends. And only five as close friends. So out of 150 friends, 15 were considered to be friends, and only five were considered to be close. That means that only 10% of our fr Facebook friends are real friends. An even lower percentage are considered close friends. So don't go home and start deleting everybody, okay? Nobody likes that, that rabid, like, Facebook friend deleter who just gets mad and goes home and starts deleting everybody, and then you get a friend request four weeks later because they feel bad. You know what I'm saying. So surface-level relationships lack true intimacy. The second thing that lacks true intimacy is insecure relationships. The next sign of a warped view of intimacy is insecure relationships. To sort of keep with the social media illustration, people often seek reassurance by their engagement on social media. Those with relationship insecurities can often turn to social media for approval or affirmation about themselves or their relationship with others. We post pictures because we get, it can give us, the, the, uh, the, give us this idealism that things are more stable than they are, right? Or we seek that affirmation from others. I know I posted a, uh, a photo of my daughter from a couple days ago, and like within two hours, she got like 200 likes. Well, then I posted I was preaching a sermon, and I got like five likes. And I'm like, all right, so I think people love my daughter more than they do my sermons, which is okay, but I was seeking affirmation. I'm kidding, kind of, not really. So we, we, can, we can post these pictures and we can seek affirmation from others. Insecure relationships often lack true intimacy. And it's also easy for people to fantasize relationships. 
It doesn't matter if someone is single in a relationship or married. The mind can begin to wander and we can sort of craft this fantasy relationship with a person who doesn't even exist or maybe someone who does. The, the exaggerated analogy would be the fan to their favorite celebrity. But the more prevalent issue would be the fantasy relationship with Facebook friends, right? Or people on our Facebook friends list. We can often begin to craft this, this fantasy relationship with somebody else. In the 1890s, Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov observed that every time he rang a bell, he did a study on dogs, every time he rang a bell to signal mealtime, his dogs would salivate, whether food was brought to them or not. So every time he rang this bell, they would salivate whether food was brought to them or not. Similarly, recent research has shown that people often have more brain activity anticipating a reward than actually receiving one. So we have more brain activity when we anticipate a reward coming than actually receiving a reward. In this case, when we get a notification on our cell phone or on social media, we create or anticipate creating intimate relations with intimate relationships with the person on the other end. We, we, we anticipate a reward that there's going to be an intimate relationship on the other end rather than forming productive relationships in real life. We aren't really different than Pavlov's dogs who salivated when they heard the bell sung, sung or rung because every time a notification goes off on our phone, that sort of reward uh, kicks in into our own brains. We view it as a sense of belonging with someone on our friends list. For many of us, the mere thought of being friends on social media is sufficient, a lack of true intimacy. That notification goes off, we can sort of create as if the person who gives us the most likes on a, on a Facebook post or, a, or on Instagram or whatever it may be is somehow that's the closer friend that we have. Fantasizing relationships lack true intimacy. Hey, really quick, let me just get on a rabbit trail. Just because you post something and, and it says, only my real friends will read this whole post and share it with 15 friends and like it and, you know, and direct message it. Just because people don't share it and don't like it doesn't mean they're not your real friends. Just as the ones who do like it and do share it aren't truly your real friends. Amen, somebody? Come on. The last thing would be, as we think about a lack of true intimacy, would be distorted relationships. Our culture's lack of regard for true intimacy often results in distorted relationships or a distorted view of relationships. It's no, it's no secret that our culture, we are, in our culture, we are bombarded um, by all types of sexual sin, and it's even became a lifestyle that is not a part of God's design or plan. It's everywhere. It hides and lurks in everyone's heart. It, it's, it's in the media. It's all around. It's, it, it exposes a very distorted view of relationships in our culture. It even rewires our brains as in significant ways. The uh, adult online websites have capitalized on culture's broken view of intimacy. It's a real cultural problem. It's grave, it's somber, and it's a, it's a, it's a serious sin. It destroys relationships, friendships, and marriages. It destroys hearts. We live in a culture that doesn't want to call, uh, that wants to call the right left and the left right dark light and light dark. Isaiah says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and for sweet bitter. See, ice cream is sweet and broccoli is bitter. We wouldn't ever call ice cream bitter and broccoli sweet, but in our culture today, we have a serious cultural issue. We don't call the right, the, you know, call the right, right, and the wrong, wrong. We, we don't call the dark, dark, and the light, light. We like to call the dark, light, and the light, dark. It's a real cultural issue that we face. In a Gallup poll this past year, four out of 10 Americans said that watching adult online sites was morally acceptable. Morally acceptable. We have a cultural problem from surface level relationships to uh, insecure relationships to uh, fantasizing relationships and even extremely distorted relationships. We have a warped view of intimacy and it plagues our culture and exposes a very broken and needy world. These are contemporary issues, but these aren't new to Jesus' to Jesus's day and when he was speaking to his followers. He says this. So he says that we could search for intimacy in all the wrong places. So he says it like this. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
So Jesus, he gives these rules, uh, these ethical rules of what it means to be the people of God in a very hostile culture. This is what it means to be the people of God. He gives, he quotes the seventh commandment of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. He quotes the seventh one, you shall not commit adultery. It was common for people to believe that they, if they just followed a set of rules, that they were in the clear. I think that's a lot like how our culture is. We see how far can we get away with something until it's not considered okay. I know on a very light note, like my daughter, uh, I'll tell her, do not throw something. And then you know how it is, parents. So instead of chucking it across the room, she'll throw it like four feet. And then she'll test to see how far she can get away with something. See, we live in a culture that we want to see how far we can go. And so when Jesus is sharing this, he's sharing that, yes, there's this rule. There's this law that God has put in place to protect you you, and to to uphold the covenant, the promise of God. You shall not commit adultery. But he goes beyond that rule. He goes well beyond that rule and he gets inside of the heart and he gives this command, do not lust. He's saying that God's way is more than just following rules, but it's also an internal spiritual condition of our hearts. Jesus is saying that committing adultery is against God's commands, but to recognize it long before it happens. We see it elsewhere in scripture like this in in the book of James. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. death. If, if, If lust is the root, then adultery is the fruit. And Jesus is saying that this is that just as do not commit adultery is, is a grave sin, he's also saying, look at the spiritual condition of your heart. Do not lust. God's way is to not lust. It's a command that is designed to protect us. It's a command that's designed to protect us. This, this morning I was cutting strawberries and my daughter really wanted me to give her the knife to cut the strawberries. And there's no way I'm giving my daughter that knife. Why? Because I want to protect her. In the same way, God gives us and outlines ways in which we are to live because he wants to protect us. God has certain ways of living. God knows better than we do. So he gives the command to not commit adultery and do not lust. God is not only concerned with our behavior and the way we live, but he's concerned with the internal spiritual condition of our hearts. That's the cultural problem we face. That's what's in front of us. But here's why we can't do it. Do not lust is a weighty command. And those who desire to live in an intimate relationship with God would want to follow it. Yet there's not a single person who is capable of following this command on their own. Our hearts and our minds are conditioned to think and live another way. Left to ourselves, we search for, for, for intimacy in all the wrong places. Left to ourselves, we search for intimacy in all the wrong places. It's only one click away, figuratively and literally. Figuratively, it's only one click away because our minds can so easily wander, wander and go down paths that we would have never, never hoped for. We can go down paths that aren't from God. In any given moment, there are triggers that can send us down a lustful path that doesn't lead to us experiencing true intimacy. Literally, it's as simple as scrolling down on your news feed and fantasizing about some relationship that isn't real. It's allowing your mind to think, well, if I only would have married so-and-so, or if I was in a relationship with so-and-so, or, or if I had this or I had that, then it would be... Literally, it's the same thing. It's fantasizing relationships. Left to ourselves, our minds can wander. Left to ourselves, we can't follow the command to not lust because... Left to ourselves, we don't know true intimacy. We get glimpses of it. We've all had intimate relationship with loved ones, friends, spouses, whatever it may be. We get glimpses of true intimacy. And we experience what it means to be known and for someone to know us deeply. Yet the deepest and most true form of intimacy is that with with God. The God who created us, the God who knows us. The deepest form of intimacy is to know God himself. But we can't know his way for our lives without first knowing him. If we're honest with ourselves, there's a part of us that doesn't desire to submit to God. This is why we can't do it. There's a part of us that doesn't desire to submit from God to God. 
Colossians 1.21 says this, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. Our own evil behaviors keep us from knowing the true intimacy of God. That's why Jesus gives a command to not lust because there are certain ways of being and doing that result in true intimacy with him. God's ways are perfect and God's ways are holy. And we've all lived in such a way in which we are alienated from God. Number two, sin makes our way seem more gratifying than God's way. Sin makes our way seem more gratifying than God's way. Romans 8, 7 through 8. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Sin desires to unravel every beautiful thing that God has created in our lives. The craving gets stronger and stronger and cannot be fulfilled. It leads, as the scripture says, essentially to spiritual death. We, when we live in that realm, we cannot please God. And we were all once there. We were all once alienated from God. And how easy it is to go back there. How easy it is. There's a, there's a story, an uh, old tale of how, how a person, how this Eskimo kills a wolf. And the tale goes like this. It says that this wolf was, so, was craving so deeply for the taste of blood. And the Eskimo, knowing this, freezes a knife and sets it blade up in the snow and it ices over and ices over and there's blood. he puts blood on the knife and it ices over and ices over. And this, and this wolf seeks out, searches and tracks for miles and miles for blood and begins to catch the, the whiff of it and goes and goes and goes and finds this, this object laying in the snow. And he begins to, to, to eat and to lick and to lick and he wants that taste of blood. And by the, as, he, as he goes through it, he doesn't begin to realize that his blade is beginning to cut into his own body and he's, he's getting the taste of his own blood until he's find dead in the dawn. So it is with lust. It's, so it is with anything not of God. It becomes a craving and a craving to be fulfilled and to fulfill. And the only true way to fill it is from God itself. Sin makes our way seem more gratifying than God's way and it leads to spiritual death. Sin keeps people in that realm. It's difficult when you know the way to actually go the way. That's why Paul says, uh, he says that, that when, when he began to even know God's way or go, know God's law to not covet, it said sin began to produce in him all types of coveting. Meaning he, it's even more difficult when he knew the way to actually go the way. See, when God exposes the way to you, it's actually more difficult to begin to go the way. Even if you understand God's way for your own life, it doesn't make it easier. How often do we, in our lives, know the right thing to do and not do it? How often do we know the right thing to do, yet we don't do it? That's how it works in God's kingdom. We, sin takes root and keeps us longer than we, takes us further than we wanted to go and keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. And when you live in that, that realm, when you live in that way, it leads to spiritual death. Just because you know the way, it's still difficult to go the way. Left to ourselves, we search for intimacy in all the wrong places. It's tough to admit, but it's a part of God and the process of God doing something new in your life. It's admitting that left to ourselves, we're at a dead end. Left to ourselves, we'll look for intimacy in all the wrong places. Nobody can follow God's way perfectly except for Jesus. Nobody can follow God's way perfectly except for Jesus. We were all once rebellious to God. Jesus never was. We have all fell short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. Jesus never did. Scripture says it like this. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. The way Jesus lived, he fulfilled every command that God had set out. He was God's new creation. In a broken world, he was able to live because he was, is the son of God. He was able to live in such a way that glorified God in every thought and every action. Jesus is perfect. Nobody can follow the way of God perfectly except for Jesus. Second Corinthians says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
Where we've failed, Jesus never did. Where others have failed, Jesus never did. Yet God sent his only son, Jesus, to pay the price for our failures. Every mistake that we've made, every, every past, past hurt, every, every trail that you wish you didn't go down, Jesus paid the price so, we did not, so that we don't have to live that way. When we search for intimacy in all the wrong places, Jesus showed what true intimacy look like with the Father. Intimacy with God is often found in the places we need to trust him most. Last week it was hate. This week it's lust. Intimacy with God is often found in the places that we need to trust him most. Trusting in Jesus, left to ourselves, we can't do it, but trusting in Jesus and living in an intimate relationship with God the Father will help you live with the truest sense of of intimacy, and it'll permeate every area of your lives. When you believe in Jesus and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, you will experience true intimacy. You can never live, God, live God's way without God himself. When you believe in Jesus, he gives you his spirit to guide you, and through him, all things are possible. Through him, you too can follow his commands and live the way that God designed for you to live in a very hostile culture. Scripture says this, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. When we live by the Spirit, we experience life and peace. That's why Paul says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That is the word of God. That means that you have the Spirit of God inside of you. When you trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, and you experience an intimate relationship with him, there is no thing that can overtake you because you have the Spirit of God living in you. I'd like to give you some very practical ways for you to guard your heart, to guard your family and those that you love. But first, Jesus, when, he, when, we, when we go to these practical ways, Jesus spoke in very exaggerated language, but it's very important that we listen to it. He says this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Otherwise, in other words, it's, it's better to take desperate measures. It's better to lose a little than it is to lose a lot. It's better to take desperate measures and to lose a little than it is to lose a lot. See, in this time, uh, in Jewish culture, the right, the right, see, the right eye and the right hand symbolize power. The right side symbolize power. And he's saying it's better just to rip out that little bit of power and to live in the way God, than to lose everything, to lose everything. Jesus really wants to get his point across. He's saying take desperate measures to protect your life from sexual sin. He is saying it is better to lose a little bit than to lose it all. Take desperate measures. Here are three ways that you can take desperate measures if you want to follow the commands of God. Number one, identify the source of temptation. You can't treat a disease until you know it is there. I remember when I was sick a few years ago with an autoimmune disease, and for months I could not identify the problem. I probably self-diagnosed myself more times than I needed to. It wasn't until I went to a doctor and found out the, what the problem was, I was able to identify it and act accordingly. In the same way, we, ask, we need to ask God to reveal areas in our lives that are, that are susceptible to temptation. It may be with another person. It may be on your social media. It may be on your cell phone. Ask God to show you what's causing you to stumble. Ask God where your blind spots are. Guard your intimacy with God that comes in Christ. Identify the source of temptation. Number two, cut it out of your life. Once you figure out what the source of temptation is, take desperate measures to cut it out of your life. That's why he says it is better for you to gouge your eye out than to lose your whole body. It's better for you to cut your hand off than to lose your whole body. This, 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 this exaggerated language is saying it's better to go through the pain 
of losing that little bit than it is to lose everything. Once you figure it out, cut it out of your life. It may be as simple as not having a certain conversation because it's better to lose out on that conversation than it is to lose out on your family. It may be as simple as losing the internet. It may be better for you to cut off your cell phone and to cut off your internet than it is to go down that path. It is better to tell your, your spouse your thoughts, even if it hurts. It is better to tell your spouse your thoughts than to lose everything. Take desperate measures to cut the source of temptation out of your life. It's like taking the knife to the wolf. Don't be the wolf. Be the one who is willing to take desperate measures to kill that very thing that you know would destroy your life. Don't do it alone. Pursue accountability. I think there, there's this very odd sort of thought that if you pursue accountability that you're somehow weak. Pursue accountability. I'm accountable. I'm accountable to my wife. I, you, you, it, you don't have to have an issue to pursue accountability. Actually, Scripture tells us that we are to be accountable to one another. We're accountable to Christ Jesus himself, and we're accountable to the church. So pursue accountability. If you're struggling, there are a lot of ways in which you can pursue accountability. It may be as simple as a software called Covenant Eyes. Pay t- is, is, your, is your family and your marriage worth $10 a month? $10 a month. It may be as simple as admitting something to someone who you know is going to put you on the right path. If you want to live God's way, then do everything in your power to remove the source of temptation. It may be as simple, do not drive alone with somebody else of the opposite sex. The moment something crosses even the slightest emotional or physical boundary line, stop sending them messages. Add them in a group message. Take desperate measures and cut it out. If it's someone you work with, be honest with your spouse and or with a friend and say, listen, I, I want to protect our marriage. I just want to let you know about so-and-so. The day that you're getting ready in the mirror for somebody else is the day you need to get on your knees and pray. Cut out the source of temptation. If temptation happens and, and, and you use your cell phone to satisfy that temptation, throw it away. I would rather take a sledgehammer to my computer than lose my family. It is better to lose a friend than it is to lose intimacy with God. So identify the source of temptation, number one. Number two, number two, cut it out of your life. Number three, fill the gap with truth. Fill the gap with truth. Yes, it's painful to lose something. That's why Jesus paints this picture of gouging out an eye or losing a hand. Fill the gap of that perceived loss with knowledge and truth. If you cut out a person from your life that you were seeking affirmation from, turn your attention to your spouse. Turn your attention to God himself. Yes, it may hurt. It can't happen slowly. That's why Jesus says, rip the eye out, cut the hand, take desperate measures, and then fill that perceived loss with knowledge and truth. Fill the intimacy gap with true intimacy that is only found in Jesus Christ. If you're seeking affirmation through social media or in an unhealthy way through somebody else, cut it out and fill it with knowledge and truth that comes in Christ. Second Corinthians says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's filling yourself with the knowledge of truth. That's filling yourself with the intimacy of God that you're prepared at any given moment with any given thought that pops in your head, you're prepared to hold it captive and hold it obedient to Christ. The moment that thought pops up, I'm not going there. That's not who I am. That's, not, that's no longer who I am in Christ. I will not go there. Don't dwell on it. Have a life of prayer. Spend time in intimate, intimate time with God. Pray fast. Memorize scripture so that you are prepared. Jesus, when he was tested and tempted in the wilderness, was filled with the knowledge of truth and intimacy with the Father that he was so prepared to quote scripture, to quote the promises of God 
in a situation in which he was being attacked. Know the word of God. Memorize it. Fill yourself, your home, your kids with the ways of God. The best way to combat lies is to live a life of truth. Most importantly, remember, true intimacy is in Christ. If you've been hurt before, true intimacy is in Christ. If you're going the wrong way, true intimacy is in Christ. If you're married, single, dating, true intimacy is in Christ. When when you begin to search for intimacy in all the wrong places, remember where true intimacy comes from. It comes from God the Father himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be truly intimate with you, God. And in very hostile culture, Lord, that we can live contrast to that way. God, that you choose a way forward for us that brings life, that brings peace. And your spirit is willing for anybody in here, God, to trust in your name. Lord, I pray for those that may be going down the wrong path. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ that they would turn to you and experience the love that comes from you. And Father, I pray for those that may be hurt by other people's actions, Lord, that they would find that true intimacy comes in Christ, your son. Lord, I pray for each person in here, God. Father, that we would live a life that is holy and acceptable to you. God, and that we would realize that just because we know the way doesn't mean it's an easy way to walk down, God. Father, every single day, every single moment, we need to be prepared to hold our thoughts captive and obedient to you and prepared to make decisions that guard our intimacy with you, that guard our families, that guard the relationships around us, God. Father, let us always be on guard. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, will you stand together and we'll worship? I'll invite our prayer team forward if you have a prayer request.